I'd like to welcome back everyone in person and online to the second stage of the 2023 ANU Climate Update. My name is Caitlin Balyak, and I will be chairing the discussion following our wonderful panelists who will be examining how we can sequester carbon while achieving other societal goals. I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners whose unceded lands we gather on here today in person, the Nunuwal and Ngambri peoples, pay my respects to their elders and the elders whose lands folks are joining us from online. I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for being some of the oldest carbon farmers in the world, as they have been looking after country for tens of thousands of years. And we know that with healthy country comes carbon sequestration. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to clarify some terminology that we'll be using in this session today. We'll be broadly talking about how we can take carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of our atmosphere and store them for a long time in ways that do not contribute to climate change. Some terms that are used to talk about this process include carbon removal, greenhouse gas removal, carbon sequestration, negative emissions, carbon drawdown, and carbon farming. And while these terms have subtle differences, they generally reference taking those greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere and storing them. It's important to clarify this as the nascent negative emissions space is still trying to settle on a common language that can confuse even folks who work, live and breathe in the climate, energy and disaster space. So I'm joined by three wonderful panelists today. Professor Diana D'Alessandro, who is a chemist and professor at the schools of chemistry and chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Sydney. She has recently been appointed as the director of the Faculty of Engineering's Net Zero Initiative, which aims to help government, industry and communities to swiftly manufacture, deploy and adopt cost effective low emissions technologies at scale. Diana will present on the negative emissions agenda and on the technological side of carbon removal. Professor Andrew McIntosh, who is a leading environmental law and policy scholar and a professor at the ANU College of Law. Professor McIntosh is a cross-disciplinary researcher, which involves the application of legal, economic and political science methods to the study of environmental policy and problems and processes. He's been a fierce advocate for integrity restoration within the Australian carbon market. Andrew will present on carbon sequestration and integrity in the Australian context. And finally, Dr. Sarah Milne, who is the convener of the Masters of Environmental Management and Development and Graduate Certificate in Environmental Management at ANU. Sarah's research examines natural resource, resource struggles and environmental interventions with a particular focus on carbon markets in Southeast Asia and more recently, Australia. Sarah will present on the co-benefits and co-risks that come along with carbon sequestration. Before I hand over to Professor D'Alessandro to kick us off, I'd like to remind everyone to submit questions via the VVOX app. Um, the slide will appear behind me um, during the session and folks can refer to that to continue to submit questions as with the first session to the app, which we will use for audience Q&A later on. So I'd now like to invite um, Professor Diana D'Alessandro up onto the stage to present on the negative emissions agenda. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Let me, there we go. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people uh, whose lands we meet here on today. Look, my um, this beautiful picture that you see behind me is actually my home in Far North Queensland. I'm from Jabagai land. And I grew up with the beauty of this surrounding. This is the reason why I studied science and engineering at university. And it's the reason that I'm standing here in front of you today. Of course, as Caitlin said, the Indigenous peoples have cared for country for over 60,000 years, and it's that same spirit of care for country that brings me here today and is the reason that I'm doing the work that I do. So the reality that we're faced with here is that net zero is not enough. To reach net zero, we have to also recognise that since the industrial era began, our human race has emitted uh, uh, emissions into the atmosphere 
And in order to actually reach net zero, we also have to do work to actively remove these emissions from the atmosphere. So these are known as negative emissions, as Caitlin mentioned. And in fact, all of the modelling shows from the IPCC, as Mark was just mentioning, that in order to reach uh, a maximum global temperature rise of one and a half to two degrees, all of the routes to do that must involve negative emissions. So I realise this is a bit of a cartoon compared with what we saw from Mark uh, a short time ago, but really what this graph shows us is that in addition to mitigation approaches, and we have to recognise here, there is no silver bullet that we have. This is going to take everything that we have to throw at. In addition to these conventional mitigation approaches, reducing uh, demand and reducing emissions, we also have to, as humans, actively remove the legacy emissions in our atmosphere. And this graph is a little uh, misleading in a sense, and, and Mark has really shown you, done a beautiful job of showing you where we are at this minute in time. And in fact, you know, that the net zero target here of 2050 is in fact sliding right before our eyes. So what are our options? As I mentioned, there is no silver bullet here and actually everything needs to be out on the table, but we do have solutions. And Mark sort of ended his um, presentation and the ambassador commented that we have to have hope here. And I think there should be hope. You should realize that actually Australian industry is indeed playing a very active role in this space. And what I wanted to do was actually give you that sense of hope today. So if we look at just some of the smothering of options, and by, by this, this is no means uh, comprehensive, but some of the major approaches that we have at our fingertips to address this issue of drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, cover both nature-based solutions. So these are terrestrial solutions, and Andrew will pick up on, on some of this discussion later, land-based solutions, soil carbon, biochar, ocean-based solutions. And in fact, this is a, a really nascent area in fact, with conversation that is critically needed. Up in Sydney in a couple of weeks time, we have Ocean Decade Australia taking a leading role in the conversation about what can the ocean, which covers 70% of the face of our, our earth, what can it do to, to play a role uh, in drawing down carbon dioxide? And then of course, we have the technological approaches, which I'm really gonna focus on today. So what we might call biochemical approaches, geochemical approaches, or indeed chemical. Uh, approaches. So the question, of course, that everyone asks is, well, where are we at? And so we consider now the, the technological readiness, and it's no surprise that, of course, that the issue is so urgent that indeed we need the low-hanging fruit here. And this is what you might call uh, nature-based or, or natural uh, solutions. So indeed, yes, these are less costly and they're closer to deployment. But the reality is they're also more vulnerable to reversal. And by that, I mean that, in fact, the longevity of carbon removals is really of the order of, say, 10 to 20 years, perhaps a little bit more. When we talk about technological options, then, yes, these are more costly. Yes, there are greater R&D needs, but indeed the capacity for longer term uh, sequestration is far greater than nature-based approaches. So what about the challenges? Well, in nature-based approaches, we do have to question the effects on biodiversity. We have to question the verification of measurements. And I know there'll be a significant discussion later with Andrew's presentation on this front. What about technological approaches? Well, of course, there's gonna be this competition for land use. It's high cost, yes. And some of these concepts are relatively untested. But I think what I really want you to know is I want you to have hope. And I want you to know that there is indeed extremely strong international and uh, domestic demand in this space. And I want to talk a little bit about, and I am just cherry picking here, but direct air capture is one of uh, the most uh, advanced technical opportunities for carbon removals. This is the Climeworks, which has really been a standout company in the world, and it's actively got a number of projects worldwide. This one particular one called Orca in Iceland removes 4,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide per annum. Now, considering that by mid-century, we need to be removing at least 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and indeed by the end of the century, at least 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere 
you can see that this is not even a drop in the ocean of what we need. So the scaling of these technical solutions like direct air capture is of course front and centre of mind. But I wanted to mention that there are indeed many companies working on this. And in fact, our own CSIRO uh, here in Australia has the Athena project, which is actively uh, a solution that actively removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I also wanted to make a point about the financial uh, situation here because we have this interesting situation where we have pre-market purchases entering the marketplace and Frontier is one example of this. This is a consortium of pre-market purchases, including Meta, Stripe, Shopify, who have made a commitment to help this industry reduce its costs and scale fast. So this is quite interesting. The Biden administration in the United States has also taken a very strong stance here in investing multi-billions of dollars in this technology of direct air capture. Now, it's not just direct air capture, but of course the question is, well, what do you do with the captured CO2? So again, just to cherry pick, mineral carbonation is a very significant uh, opportunity for Australia. And the reason is that we have significant uh, and, and appropriate geology within which to store carbon dioxide. So for example, basaltic soils are very good at storing carbon dioxide. So there are these projects, for example, like CO2 to stone that literally turns gaseous carbon dioxide into rock. And obviously then we're talking about uh, permanent geological storage. We also have this interesting example with some of our biggest industries like BHP demonstrating that in fact mine tailings like nickel tailings can actively uh, and here I am the chemist in me coming out here can actively react with carbon dioxide and actually again form uh, mineral carbonates that permanently sequester the carbon dioxide but there are problems first of all the injectivity rates into these porous basaltic soils we're yet to unlock the the full potential of this and of course, there are big questions about measurement, reporting and verification or what we might call MRV. I mentioned before, there is a very significant conversation that Australia as a continent surrounded by ocean needs to have about the potential for long duration carbon removals in our oceans. Again, significant questions about effects on ecosystems and the longevity of removals. And just in the last minute, I wanna make a proposition or a proposal to you if you like about what the, the hope is, what the opportunity here is for Australia. Negative emissions present an entirely new industrial opportunity for Australia, and I mean that in the best sense possible. It's going to be essential for us to reach net zero. It presents an opportunity to have a new regional manufacturing sector, the transitioning and creation of jobs, co-benefits, will be, which will be discussed a little bit later, and indeed a new billion dollar export industry for Australia. So this is my personal experience. I'm a researcher. I have a research group. I'm a materials chemist working in a lab on nanoporous materials that capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In collaboration with Australian startups, Southern Grain Gas and Aspiridac, we are now translating these materials into the field. This is a fully solar powered process. And herein lies the opportunity for Australia. So I should say, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not trying to sell you anything. What I want to do is just, just end on hope, really. Here's the, here's the opportunity for Australia. As for example, direct air capture could be a platform technology for Australia for sustainable carbon hubs. So we could envisage that you might have a solar driven CO2 capture field. You could perform carbon removals or negative emissions with that. But consider that actually this could allow us to fundamentally rethink carbon because we can turn carbon dioxide into fuels, for example, sustainable aviation fuel, green methanol, green methane. We can use it to feed algae and turn that into, into foods and fuels uh, in order to uh, sustain our population. We can turn it into green chemicals and green fertilizers. So that's the thought I wanted to leave you on was the hope and the opportunity. Thanks, Caitlin.
That was absolutely fantastic context setting for us from Professor D'Alessandro. And so wonderful to be given um, some hope and optimism. Hopefully that goes part of the way to addressing the question we received earlier from the audience about preserving mental health. It's also nice to have a little bit of optimism injected before we hear about integrity in the Australian carbon market from Professor Andrew McIntosh. Thanks, everybody. Pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and thank you very much to the Institute for putting on this event. I'll try and keep things positive, at least to start with. A lot of people... Sorry, how do I use the... There we go. Great. Um, I'll try and start on a positive note and that is uh, that I'm a huge believer in offsets. A lot of people think that I hate offsets and I want to tear them down and never want to see them used. That couldn't be further from the truth um, from, from my perspective. It also does not represent the position of the research team with which I work at ANU and the UNSW. Uh, we're all big believers that offset markets can do wonderful things both in the carbon space and also in the biodiversity space. It'd be strange if we didn't believe that because almost all of us have worked in the space for at least 10 years. The reason we like offsets so much is that up on the board, offsets reduce the cost of achieving the outcome you are seeking. In this space, the idea is simply that you give credits to one party for reducing their emissions and you allow them to trade it to another party that wants to increase their emissions. That works because party A has lower abatement costs than party B, and that means at an economy-wide level, we can achieve uh, emission reduction targets at lower cost. And that's what we're about. As policy people, I'm looking at Frank Jotso. I know he spent a lot of his career thinking about the ways to do this. And offsets provide that opportunity. Not only that, offsets also provide the opportunity of generating co-benefits, the last point down the bottom. These are obviously part of the cost equation, but they're crucial. There's certain areas where if you undertake offset projects, you can generate wonderful social benefits. You can also generate wonderful biodiversity benefits. We've spent the last two years or so, possibly three, working on trying to promote environmental planting projects. And one of the primary reasons is that those projects can not only provide a very legitimate way to reduce emissions, they can also provide wonderful biodiversity benefits, particularly in agricultural landscapes that have been stripped of vegetation. But then you say, okay, Andrew, if things are so damn rosy, why have you spent the last, well, four to five years complaining about Australia's offset market? And the reason is that these things are highly controversial and they're highly controversial because the benefits hinge on the credits having integrity. And by that, I mean that they represent real and additional abatement. Real means there's actually been a reduction in emission, so we don't hand out carbon credits for people to sequester CO2 in trees that don't exist. That should be relatively simple. And the other thing is that we don't ha hand out carbon credits unless the reduction wouldn't have happened anyway. That is, the reduction is contingent on the issuance of the carbon credit. Now, unfortunately, for those who love the theory like I do, reality tells us that we very, very rarely get this right. It's not only in Australia where these problems have happened. A lot of people think, oh, Australia's scheme, is it the only one? The answer is no. Any single time a researcher, an independent research group has looked at offsets, they have found the same thing. In fact, the results are spookily similar, that most research teams find that 70% or more of the credits that are issued do not represent real and additional abatement. Shouldn't that tell us something? Well, certainly told us something. When I say that, so independent groups have looked at the Greenhouse Gas Abatement Scheme, which was the world's first emissions trading scheme that had offsets. They came to a similar conclusion. When they looked at the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, they came to the same conclusion. When they looked at the JI, Joint Implementation under the Kyoto Protocol, they came to the same conclusion. Are you getting the idea here? I've got a bit of momentum going because I can keep going. The Californian Scheme, there are obviously most people in the audience would have seen that recently and of course our findings on the emissions reduction scheme so there's a problem and the problem comes down to that key point up there and the main point i'm trying to make there is that offsets are a high risk policy instrument hopefully a lot of you have seen the mitigation hierarchy that talks about avoid first mitigate second offset third it should actually be called a policy risk framework because that is the idea that sits behind it. 
Avoidance is low risk, mit mitigation is medium risk, and offsets are high risk. And the reason they are high risk is because when you're trying to devise an offset scheme, it's very easy to get it wrong. Trust me, I tried and I tried my heart out to get things right, but in, in despite my concerted efforts and the concerted efforts of a lot of other people, including someone I'm looking at right now, we got it wrong. We made innocent, honest mistakes. We were trying our hardest and we got it wrong. And it's because you're working with counterfactuals. Anytime you're working with the counterfactuals, it's hard and you're gonna make mistakes. But importantly for offsets, the consequences are really bad. When you get it wrong, by definition, you are likely to increase emissions. So the very tool that you are trying to use to drive down emissions actually works in the opposite direction. And as a consequence, I beg policymakers only ever use these things when you have high confidence that you're gonna get real and additional abatement. And that means you've got to use other policy instruments. Just quickly, because I'm sure someone's going to start throwing fruit at me, that there's a bunch of other factors that drive suboptimal outcomes in this space. The first one's adverse selection. Now, the economists will know exactly what I'm talking about there. It just simply means circumstances where asymmetries of information between two parties result in selective participation to the detriment of the other party. That all means might be mumbo jumbo to you, but give, let me give you an example. If I wanted to incentivize a landholder to not chop down a tree, and I've got a suite of landholders that I'm wanting to do this, I only want to offer that offset to someone who is actually going to do the tree, the tree chopping down. But it's really hard to design a set of rules that isolates on that landholder and doesn't let in the others. But the very basics of economics will tell you that the other ones who are never going to chop down the tree will be the first to come forward and say, I want carbon credits. Why? Because what's the cost of not chopping down a tree if you were never going to chop it down? Zero, right? It's zero. The only cost is the transaction cost. So you're dealing with offsets, you're dealing with adverse selection all the time. And it's, again, very hard to work against it. The other one is what legal scholars call legal corruption. This is where you get parties that are able to ma manipulate the rules to their advantage. In offset schemes, you've got a ready-made incubator for legal corruption. And the reason is because the rules are incredibly complex and that results in a set of intermediaries that are often very close to the regulator. And as a consequence of that, they have a disproportionate or outsized influence on rulemaking and that can drive offset schemes down very, very bad paths. The final thing I'll just mention is what I call the environmental cheer squad. The, um, a lot of people look at offsets as a bucket of money that they can use and try and push to solve their problems, whether it be biodiversity, whether it be social problems, you name it, everybody turns up and says, I want offsets for, insert idiot idea here. And as a consequence, it's, and it's not always a bad idea. And oftentimes I should rephrase that. Often the idea of giving money for that is a very valid and good idea, but it's just that offsets are the worst possible instrument to do it but they're so desperate to get the money, they forget that golden rule I mentioned before. And again, I just about to be yelled at. I'll finish on this note, which is a bit of a downer, but I know a lot of people will be saying, what do you mean when you say these schemes have failed? Well, hopefully you can see what's up on the screen there. This is a, a, the project type called Human Induced Regeneration Under the Emissions Reduction Fund. I would argue this is the world's stupidest and stupidest by, I mean, completely lacking the integrity of any offset type in the world. And I can argue that with anybody. We've had HFC 23 credits under the CDM, where they're giving out credits for people to set up and, and shut down phony HFC factories. This beats it. H this idea, this human induced regeneration is meant to be providing people, farmers, landholders, carbon credits for regenerating native forests and when it was originally designed, it was meant to be around this idea. They do not plant trees. Let's be very clear about this. There is no tree planting. It's prohibited under the method. The whole idea is that you would start with a property that you look like on the left that had been cleared. It previously had forest and someone brought out a D10 bulldozer and they bulldozed down the trees. Now we provide the landholder carbon credits and that allow them to regrow the forest. So you start on the left you end up on the right. That is a wonderful idea. It's cheap abatement with good biodiversity outcomes. But what has happened? 
that. People have been allowed to start with projects in intact remnant vegetation that has never been comprehensively cleared in circumstances where they are being credited as if they were regrowing an even aged forest like the one from there to there. So they have to be grossly overcredited. Not only that, it's ecologically impossible to regenerate an even aged forest. Now I've got the person there about to drag me off. I can show this later, but the last thing I'll just cry for, my cry for hope is if we wanna get this right, the only way can, we can do this is letting third parties in. That is allowing third parties to have complete access to information, allowing third parties to truly participate, not lip service, and finally allowing third parties access to courts to ensure when that sort of thing happens, that third parties can drag them to the court to stop it. I'll shut up now. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I, for one, am very grateful that today I happen to be sitting on the same side of the fence as Professor McIntosh. Can't imagine what he must have used to have done to his peers back in his mooting or debating days back at university or more recently, policymakers. Um, so our final speaker for this session, um, Dr. Sarah Milne, will be um, taking us through some of the co-benefits and co-risks that come along with carbon farming that were touched on, such as biodiversity and social benefits in Andrew's presentation. Sarah. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm assuming, no, no. All right. First, I just want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also pay respect to any First Nations people here in the room and attending this event online. Okay, so we've heard a lot about challenges and opportunities and problems tonight. And as Caitlin said, I'm going to engage with this opportunity that is captured in the idea of co-benefits. And what I'm going to do is talk about sort of two things. First, I'll explain what we mean by co-benefits, and especially I'll do that in the context of rural and remote Australia. And second, I'll explore current efforts to reward and incentivize carbon co-benefits, both overseas and in Australia. And hopefully some of my analysis here can inform our thinking, thinking about how carbon farming can best contribute to our net zero or indeed below zero goals. Okay, so last year, I drove across Western New South Wales through endless landscapes that looked like this. Indeed, this is the on the ground view of the images that Andrew McIntosh was just showing us. These low rainfall pastoral areas have become very engaged in the Australian carbon market, mainly through the method of human induced regeneration. But as I drove through often troubled towns, there were burning questions in my mind. I was asking, so how can carbon credits help First Nations and local communities in these places? Can carbon markets be used to support landscape regeneration and biodiversity? Can carbon be an engine to revitalize the rangelands? And so these are the questions that I have in my mind in my field of research, which explores the deep links between people and nature. I'm a human geographer. So we all know about these deep links, you know, it's in our bones. Um, and, and First Nations communities especially know this. They are always saying that the health of country and the health of people are inextricably linked. So this brings us the question, how can efforts to sequester carbon in Australian landscapes also help us to secure societal well-being and healthy ecosystems and diverse ecosystems? Can we find a win-win-win scenario here? This is the realm of co-benefits that I'm talking about. Co-benefits are basically the good things that can happen alongside the production of carbon credits. Okay, so thanks to Climate Active, we have a nice diagram here that explains to us what co-benefits are. Environmental co-benefits, as we've been saying, could include biodiversity and habitat protection, improved air and water quality, restoration of cleared areas. Economic benefits could include new income streams, employment opportunities in rural communities, even increased production and resilience in farming landscapes. 
And then in terms of social and cultural benefits, we have things like capacity building, improved health and education, and for First Nations people, new opportunities to live and work on country. And we see that in particular in the Savannah Burning projects that are happening to produce carbon credits in the tropical northern parts of Australia. So opportunities abound here. And of course, this is being reflected in the market. So let me just talk a little bit about some of the market innovations that we have in this space. We have a lot to learn from voluntary and international carbon markets because they've long been engaging with co-benefits. And what they are doing is bundling carbon credits with other forms of value, like biodiversity protection or community development. So it's like a value added carbon credit. In the international domain, for example, we have a certification scheme, which is led by the Climate and Community Biodiversity Alliance, the CCBA, which is just another acronym for you to chew on. So the idea here is that you implement your emissions reductions project using an international carbon standard, normally VERA, and then you seek additional certification for the co-benefits. And the certification gets you a price premium. And this is, good. this is because many buyers now in the carbon market want to purchase credits that help biodiversity and also safeguard the, the livelihoods and rights of local and Indigenous communities. So these value-added credits, they look good, corporations are interested in them, and they're lower risk. There's a lot of market appeal here. And similarly, we are seeing movements in the voluntary market in Australia with a proliferation of new kinds of trademarks, products, units that bundle carbon with biodiversity and other co-benefits. And an example is the Eco Australia trademark credits as shown on the screen. So you're probably all thinking, fantastic, now we've got a market solution for co-benefits. Or maybe some of you are thinking, nah, there has to be more to the story. And as a critical social scientist, I'm gonna tell you that yes, there is more to this story let's unpack the market panacea a little bit. A lot of my work has been to explore the effects and implications of market solutions. And indeed, I spend a lot of time cautioning against market utopias. My research looks at what happens when we make new and virtual commodities like carbon credits. And one of the key problems is that behind the neat package of one carbon credit unit, whether it's Australian or not, are a range of methods and interventions, and some of these are highly contested. So as Andrew was saying, recent controversies in the carbon markets in Australia and overseas are showing this very vividly. Furthermore, with the drive to commodify carbon credit units, the underlying conditions and effects of the production of the carbon unit often get concealed from public view. So it's the market or commercial imperative that does not encourage transparency here. Basically, market players just want neat and clean transactions, or at least the appearance of that. So why am I telling you this? It's because the problems are not just with carbon credits, but it's also in relation to co-benefits because they're attached to the carbon credits and because attempts to commodify co-benefits hit up against the same problems. So often we find misrepresentation of local conditions through the processes of commodification. Okay, so let me just use an illustrative example from some of my fieldwork in Cambodia, where I've looked at forest carbon projects that were seeking certification of co-benefits under the Climate Community Biodiversity Alliance scheme, the one that I was mentioning earlier. So in this context, I saw how potentially very meaningful co-benefits such as those relating to Indigenous land rights and livelihoods, were reduced down to a simple checklist of standards and a scorecard for the purposes of validation and verification by carbon auditors. Problematically, these bureaucratic processes can conceal wider injustices that are playing out in the landscape, for example, in relation to Indigenous dispossession or illegal logging in the very landscapes where these carbon projects are taking place. So for many of you, you might be thinking this is just an extreme overseas example, maybe it's old news, but actually what it tells us is something about market solutions in environmental policy. So in short, we need to be cautious about potential 
um, the effects of market fixes because often the methods that are used can oversimplify local conditions and you end up with the performance of rigour and transparency with insufficient checks on reality, just as Andrew was saying. And indeed, insufficient concern for wider problems related to justice. So environmental justice is not always a consideration that markets bring to the fore. Okay, so finally, what does this mean for Australia? Now that co-benefits are attracting market value, we've got a fairly major policy challenge on our hands especially as demand for carbon credits grows. So basically our policy settings now need to guide carbon farming in Australia so that producers of high quality credits and co-benefits can be properly rewarded. At the moment, the Carbon Farming Act does not allow for this. The imperative is only for low cost abatement. And so this relies on the assumption that Australian carbon credit units are all the same. It doesn't recognize that the different the different means of production, the different qualities of carbon credits. So as Andrew has said, this creates a race to the bottom in which the cheapest credits set the market price and ultimately drive the outcomes. And namely what we get is big industry continues to pollute using offsets that are of questionable integrity. And, and sort of more importantly, the key problem with this kind of market is that the more expensive and high quality projects, the ones that we want and the ones that give us co-benefits aren't able to compete and they can't get into the market. So how do we fix this? Let me suggest that the answer may not be about another credit or an offset or a certification scheme or a unit. Maybe we need to consider stronger environmental planning and even some subsidies to achieve the things that we want namely the biodiverse landscapes in which healthy people thrive and traditional owners are there able to care for country. So a good example here is the Queensland State Government's $500 million Landscape Restoration Fund. This fund exists explicitly to value and pay for co-benefits associated with carbon farming. And the first round of projects that they've invested in is shown on this map. So this scheme enables higher quality projects to proceed, which, and these projects wouldn't otherwise proceed with normal carbon farming money. So in a sense, it helps us to see how carbon can be the co-benefit in what might be a bigger picture of investment in public goods. It's something to consider. So to conclude, I'll say, let's look north to Queensland for some inspiration. Knowing that further north in the Asia Pacific region, there are many lessons to be learned about how market panaceas do not always give us the outcomes that we want. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Milne for that important reminder that when we're talking about markets, and regulators, we need to be thinking about people and places. We need to be thinking about country and community. I'd now like to invite our speakers up onto the stage to join me where we'll have about 10 minutes of facilitated discussion before moving to an audience Q&A. And I remind you again to submit your questions via the VBOX app, um, either about the speakers' presentations or about sort of the discussion that we're kicking off now. Fantastic. Um, thank you for joining me here. Um, we heard from Mark in his presentation earlier that to remain under the Paris Agreement limits of sort of the 1.5, 2 degrees of warming, that carbon sequestration will be a part of that picture. And we also heard this. It was demonstrated really well in your presentation, Diana. And so I guess how can negative emissions industry scale to meet the, as you pointed out, gigaton scale challenge um, required to curb the climate crisis? I'll pass off to you first. So I think what's interesting here is that because of the large areas of non-arable lands we have in Australia with large, you know, significant renewable energy reserves, um, it's been discussed that in fact Australia could be a real global leader because we have the opportunity to scale, recognising of course we have to remember the potential impacts on biodiversity, um, but 
as Sarah's nicely pointed out, there are some very significant benefits for regional and rural Australia and First Nations communities. So I'm not trying, you know, this is really a big ecosystem picture. And I think the ambassador, Ambassador Telly, put it very nicely that actually this is a systems picture. This isn't just the technology. Technology alone here um, can't scale without the social acceptance and environmental justice, recognition of co-benefits, the um, recognition that this is our whole community that needs to get behind this and, and be involved. Sarah, would you like to chime in about maybe some of those considerations for involving community in these sort of scaling up processes? Yeah, so Deanna and I were talking earlier about um, having a vision for what transition looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about plonking a new sort of industrial plant in the middle of nowhere. There has to be really deep planning and consultation around local environments and local people. Um, in some ways, it's like the social license to operate that you, you can't just scale up a technical fix without a social license. So that takes huge amounts of investment from government and, and it takes planning processes. Yeah. Perhaps the other thing to comment on there is just the, the price, the price point. Uh, it was pointed out in a number of talks that the challenge here to scaling a number of the technologies that I mentioned is that, you know, these technologies sit at over US $1,000 per tonne carbon dioxide at the moment. The goal is to get to under US $100 per tonne, but that is still well, well under, you know, ACMEs are sitting at somewhere around the $30 Australian per um, tonne CO2 at the minute. So there's a, a very significant cost differential. And so as Sarah put it, you know, you go for the lowest bidder, <laughs> you go for the cheapest option. And that means that other solutions that may have greater per permanence of the carbon removals really don't get a look in at least not at the moment. And this is where, you know, these pre-market purchasers come into the picture who are helping to scale the industry and actually bring down the cost of the technologies. I'll jump in on that as well. Um, what Sarah mentioned before, and you just touched on the same thing, in, in finance, it's called Gresham's Law, uh, bad currency chasing out the good. And that's exactly what's been happening in Australia's carbon market. If I had a map of, of, uh, of offset projects, you'd see that almost all of them, in terms of land projects, are located in uncleared, semi-arid and arid areas, areas where it's ridiculous to think that you can, you can grow and regenerate forests, particularly where they've never been cleared. Very, very few projects are in the intensive ag zone, which is about 80 to 88 million hectares, where there's wonderful opportunities to scale up and do proper environmental restoration and also plant, um, plantation projects where you integrate plantations for harvest plantations into agricultural enterprises. And there's a real appetite in the agricultural community to do it, but the thing at the moment that's killing it is low prices. And as a consequence, we are retarding that transformation, the use of, of, of that opportunity to help us achieve our emission reduction targets. And it goes down to really small things. We know, because we've run this program across 12 NRM regions in Australia, that there's a chronic shortage of seed and seedlings. Well, if we push the carbon market into that space, that would be solved. The market would solve that. But at the moment, it's not there because of this Gresham's Law problem. Yeah. Sort of building on that Gresham's Law, um, sort of a deficiency of um, saplings and seedlings. Um, what are some of the other barriers to developing high quality carbon projects in Australia? And how do you think we could overcome some of those barriers? So I'll start with you, Andrew. It's just good rules. You set good roles and you allow third parties in to play the game. You give them transparency. You can drive capital to places where there's high integrity, but it all comes down to good rules, good governance, transparency, third parties participating and third parties able to take bad administrators and non-compliers to, to court. Yeah, sort of taking it to the more tech side, um, what are some of the barriers that you think, aside from price, that we're sort of facing there that um, could be yeah. solved? Look, one of the real barriers is, in fact, we're missing policy and legislation to even um, allow us to use some of these technologies. So a case in point would be uh, carbon removals in the state of New South Wales. So Queensland, uh, Victoria, South Australia and, and offshore uh, in WA do have the, the legislation. Um, New South Wales does not. So at the minute you know and that's a real opportunity again for Australia coming back to the hope and the opportunity and the optimism here is that here we have the opportunity to set Australia on a course for the decades and indeed centuries to come 
with responsible policy and legislation that you know doesn't um, doesn't just allow us to you know continue injustice of the past, um, but actually here we could really set ourselves up, set our country up for for the future. So aside from good legislation, what is the role of government um, in facilitating negative emissions industries and carbon markets within Australia? Um, Sarah. Okay, let me just a small question. one. Yes. <laughs> well, I did talk about planning and I did talk about subsidies. Um, I mean, and, and Andrew's talked about rules. I mean, the government is controlling the levers and the settings and the parameters for, for how these markets are working. Um, and so that will shape the trajectory of the market. Um, so government needs to step up into that space um, and, and bring, yeah, higher integrity, which is through more transparency and to actually invest in projects that we care about, the ones that give us the co-benefits, um, that help us choose a trajectory towards a society and an environment that we want. Um, because there are many potential transition pathways and it's actually a public choice. So the role of government is to step in and do that, is what I think. Yeah. yeah I guess at the minute, yeah. look, we're, we're trading on the free market. You know, I, I showed the example of Frontier, which is a, um, you know, I guess a, a, a free market purchaser, but, but these are really international credits because within Australia, um, a lot of these technologies are not, recognised under the Emissions Reduction Fund. There is no methodology for them. And of course, we've got all these concerns about um, proper and responsible and respectful transition. Um, so where government's needed is that, yes, okay, we can trade on the international market. Okay, industry, yes, they have a major, um, and, and private um, the private sector have a major role to play in this, but this is our country, this is our context, and there are unique attributes to the Australian situation case in point, our Indigenous peoples. And so our government absolutely has a responsibility to ensure that, yes, we can trade on the international market, but we need some framework, a responsible framework. You have experts all over the country who could be involved in that conversation. Draw them together and let's find a great solution for this. The only thing I'd add was parrot what Sarah was saying before about don't always reach for offsets. Like a lot of time, simple incentive subsidies will do the job. And also you can use subsidies to complement carbon offset markets in order to help de-risk projects, good projects, high quality projects that provide the sorts of co-benefits that, that Sarah was talking about. I might just bring us back to the point that Deanna mentioned about using the examples um, from overseas. And I'm sort of wondering what you think Australia could learn for better or for worse um, with what's happening with carbon markets overseas and sort of the negative emissions technologies that we're seeing developed over there. Um, mm -hmm. Might lead with you first, Sarah, having worked in Cambodia for a very long time. Thanks, Caitlin. Okay, so I've, I've watched the forest carbon um, space unfold in Southeast Asia over the last 10 years. and. I think, I think we could probably all agree that um, the avoided deforestation markets have been really problematic. Um, what we learned from that is exactly what Andrew's talking about. Um, if there's no transparency, then you don't see what's going on. It's too easy for closed shop credits to be made and junk credits to, to emerge. Um, so that, yeah, that's unfolding now. Um, I think my work speaks more to the, the societal context in which these projects play out. Ultimately, they are land use interventions, they're interventions in landscape. And so you can't view offset production in isolation from wider questions of environmental justice, indigenous land rights, biodiversity. So I guess it's a more needing to zoom out and take a bigger picture view of how these projects sit in landscapes is probably the key finding for me. Um, so I mentioned the, you know, for many of the technological solutions for carbon removal, but at the minute there aren't methodologies here in Australia that are recognised under the Emissions Reduction Fund. So this really is trading on the on the open market, if you like. Um, but of course, there are some fairly significant, um, very significant momentum in America. And I'm not suggesting for one minute, I hope there are no Americans in the audience. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we follow the Americans all the time. But there are some really interesting lessons to learn about um, how America has approached this. And we have a different context here in Australia, of course, that we have to recognise. Um, but 
you know, um, Andrew and Sarah have been talking about other options um, compared with what we have at the minute. And America, the US does have some of these other options. As well as that, they have investment into R&D such that these industries, these other opportunities with higher quality carbon removals opportunities can actually scale to the, the volume required and that it can help us come down the cost curve. And they are well underway. I mean, the train's left the station and here we are in Australia sitting here. So yes, there are many lessons to learn. I think the other just comment to make would be the question mark over what responsibility we have here in Australia to, um, to recognise that, you know, we put our coal on a ship and we ship it across the seas. Um, what responsibility do we have to developing nations to actually help them uh, with carbon removals as well? So far. Yeah, my only uh, value add there would be, I think one of the key lessons from overseas is be very careful with allowing uh, offsets to be used under emissions trading schemes. I think it's, it's a clear lesson from around the world. Most emissions trading schemes around the world do not allow open access to offsets. They also often have qualitative restrictions on the use of offsets. There's only one other emissions trading scheme in the world that I know of that has free access to offsets like the Labor government's proposing for the safeguard mechanism. It's Kazakhstan. And then, then we have Canada, which is the next on the list. Canada's got a 75% limit on the use of offsets. Um, and then from that, you take a huge jump down into most nations, which have sort of a 15% or below cap on, on offsets. Now, I, I don't like the idea of, of tight quantitative restrictions. What I'd prefer is a high integrity offset scheme. At the moment, we don't have one. So I, I'll ask the government, that's a key lesson, right? Restrict offsets, but don't always, don't necessarily use quantitative restrictions. You can also use qualitative restrictions. And the Canadians have shown that under their scheme, they've got qualitative restrictions on the use of offsets. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> excuse me, is you only allow certain types of offsets into your scheme. And obviously you want the ones that have high integrity. And that sort of approach I think is, is ready-made for Australia. We, we clearly know the offset types that have low integrity. So let's block them from the safeguard mechanism so we don't get to the late 2020s and come to the obvious realization that we've actually been using rubbish offsets. I mean, Kazakhstan has faster internet than Australia. Wouldn't surprise me if they were able to develop a better emissions trading scheme. Um, I'll take one more comment from Sarah before we move to the audience Q&A. Uh, I was just in, in this comparison between what's happening overseas and what's happening in Australia, in terms of landscape-based interventions that sequester carbon, the opportunity that we have here is that property rights are relatively clear and that means that you can set up fairly robust and long-term land use plans and land use arrangements. Mm -hmm. And that's what you don't have in settings Southeast Asia, where it's totally unclear who owns a forest and who can use it. Um, so we have a, actually a potential advantage um, to do very well and to lead in that space, um, given the property context. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Um, so we'll move to about 20 minutes of audience Q&A at the moment. I'm going to start with a question um, that's online and I'll alternate between in-person audience and online. Um, so to the first question that I have here that's um, been the most liked, could Professor McIntosh please expand on the point about letting third parties in and what that might look like? Yeah, people might have heard of the Our House Convention, which is a convention in Europe. It's all about three things, public participation, access to information, access to justice. And it's that sort of is a very simple idea. In fact, the ANU is relatively famous for those three things because one of our, our key uh, academics, a gentleman by the name of Braithwaite, John Braithwaite, wrote a very famous book called Responsive Regulation, which is remembered mostly for this thing called the enforcement pyramid. A lot of you might have seen it. Where it's basically the really simple idea that regulators shouldn't jump to guns first. They should try and negotiate with, with their regulated parties. But if people had bothered to turn to the next chapter of that book, it's all about that idea, that simple idea of allowing third parties to play a real role in regulation. It shouldn't be simply between the regulator and the regulated parties. You want active participation by third parties. They called it civic republicanism, but it's been taken up in all sorts of forms around the world. And it's now should be the centerpiece of, of what they call new governments, new governance. 
Um, that's that's the basic idea, and I think it's ready made for this space because of the complexity of of carbon markets and offset markets in particular. Thank you. Um, we'll move to an in-person question here. Uh, it's not so much carbon removal; it's the but it is in the area of, we've been talking about a lot: avoided deforestation. I've been involved with this since the '90s in the UN Red Scheme, which has seemed to have disappeared. But can I summarise what the panelists have been saying? It's possible to have avoided deforestation projects. I've always seen it a big positive for win-win on carbon and biodiversity, water, and so on. But you, I think, Andrew, you're saying it may be possible with good third-party verification. And then I think, Sarah, you said perhaps the other way is through government government uh, subsidies and laws. The problem is, to date, the government subsidies and laws haven't been that good on protecting habitat. So that's why I've always seen the role for a market that the, government, the government's got a commitment to a 30% land, you know, the Biodiversity Commission in natural air in in uh, conservation. So I think the, so really, so that's really, is that, am I correct in that summary that third party verification could play a role in avoided deforestation, but we really have to look also at stronger government laws and subsidies, which Sarah mentioned in terms of actually getting habitat protected and rewilding and all this sort of stuff. I can speak to the international context on that. Um, and you might, Andrew, you might want to speak about the avoided deforestation in Australia. Internationally, so many of these red plus projects, red plus, red plus is reducing emissions from forest degradation and deforestation. Most of them are taking place inside designated protected areas. So the law is saying this should be protected, but in practice, it's not getting protected. So the red plus projects on paper already look farcical because you're channeling money in for a conservation area to be properly managed. But that's okay. You have a, if you have a counterfactual scenario or projection that says deforestation rates will continue in this area, then you can build a case around proper protections to produce forest carbon credits. Um, but again, if you don't have underlying governance conditions that enable you to protect forest in those settings, you can't implement the project. And what I've seen in places like Cambodia, where illegal logging and land grabbing is rampant in protected areas, you can't actually implement the project. So then you end up with these, these vacuous junk credits. And that's what's happened in the case of Vera in the Guardian article that came out last week. Um, avoided deforestation in Australia? Yeah, well, in Australia and internationally, that I, I wouldn't say I'm against avoided deforestation credits at all or against avoided deforestation projects, what I'd say is I would only allow them where I'm very confident or we have very high confidence that those forests would have been cleared in the counterfactual without the credits. And that means you've got to have a clear indicator. Sarah's touching on, you know, a lot of times people um, extrapolate from historical trends in deforestation in an area and say, okay, therefore we can assume that a neighbouring area would be cleared. A lot of the times the reason the neighbouring area hasn't been cleared is because there's nothing there of value. They were never going to clear it. And because of that, that adverse selection problem, anytime you open the door here, if you don't have it really tight, it's sort of a lot like the water. Water will find a way through. So you've just got to be really careful. That would be my main point. But not to say blanket, no avoided deforestation credits. And that's not that's not what I'm saying. I, I basically, what I'm saying for Australia is we missed. We didn't get it right because the rules we we devised for trying to isolate those areas that were going to be cleared were flawed. And if I can add. I mean, in the context of Southeast Asia, you spend so much effort constructing the sort of historical deforestation scenario and the future scenarios and building a case and going through these very elaborate technical processes to validate and verify carbon. Sometimes it would be easier just to pay for protecting the protected area that's there on the ground. So it becomes a distraction. There's a, there's a hazard there um, that we get so caught up in trying to produce these fantastic carbon credit units, but actually we should just do conservation. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, another one online. Um, what do you think are the most promising negative emissions technologies in Australia? And then also specifically for the ACT. Um, Diana, I might start with you. And I'm going to interpret this question to assume um, in terms of the volume of carbon that we might be able to sequester um, mm -hmm. when interpreting most promising um, mm -hmm. or potentially just whatever's closest in terms of an R&D breakthrough. Yeah, perhaps easiest to, to 
you know, to talk in that respect because, um, as I said, there is sort of missing policy and legislation in some areas of Australia that mean that the hurdles are, are very different in ge different geographical locations. So I think the reality is depending, you know, one solution will is not an ultimate panacea and there will be different solutions that suit in different geographical locations. And in fact, it is indeed a portfolio approach here. There is no silver bullet. Um, but some of the really promising approaches are mineral carbonation. Um, so in Australia, we have uh, a company called MCI, uh, Mineral Carbonation International, which has gained significant recognition uh, for their ability to um, incorporate carbon dioxide, draw down carbon dioxide and incorporate it into building products. Um, and of course, this is a, a utilisation of carbon dioxide and there is indeed a question mark over um, you know, given the scale that this industry has to reach, um, could the utilisation of carbon dioxide, for example, in mineral carbonation to make building materials or indeed in, in fuels like sustainable aviation fuel, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, you, you, would all, you, you, could in, you could flood the marketplace with that particular product. Um, but remember, we're considering a, a portfolio approach here and the fact that we need everything on the table. So... Mineral carbonation is definitely seems to be a front runner, uh, but there's also work in the area of enhanced mineral weathering in Australia. Uh, the area of uh, ocean is very, very nascent, I guess, in Australia, but there are some groups, particularly in Tasmania and here at the ANU, working in the ocean space and, and a lot of potential there. We've talked a lot about nature-based solutions. Um, obviously, I've talked about direct air capture, but the scaling of that solution faces a number of hurdles, not just the policy and legislative hurdles, um, but also the fact that at the minute the price point is at least 10 times higher than where we need to get to, despite the fact that, you know, the permanence of carbon removals is something we should consider very seriously um, across the board. Uh, so I haven't really given you an answer except to say I think we need it all. Um, it is interesting to note that the Australian Academy of Science and the Climate Change Authority, um, there have been a number of us in the room who have sat on roundtables and in the next two months there will be significant reports coming out from both of those, uh, both the CCA and the Australian Academy of Science on uh, thoughts about what would be the best mix or combination of solution, technological solutions for Australia. So I think watch out for those reports. Exciting time in this space. Um, I might just direct to the second aspect of the question about what might be, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the negative emissions technology, but we can also look at sort of carbon credit projects. What would be um, sort of the best for the ACT region, I guess, considering it's an area that is already largely forested um, and lush with national parks? Hmm. <laughs> Putting this to the two folks who actually live in the ACT. Well, I think realistically in the ACT, the opportunities are really quite limited, mm -hmm. particularly with existing technologies. And you probably wouldn't take some mm -hmm. of the technologies we just heard about and base them in the ACT. Um, there's still obviously places where you can put trees. There's also some places where you can change land management practices to, to sequester carbon in soils. Um, I would strongly advocate people don't issue carbon credits for soils because it's a extremely fraught area. Um, but yeah, realistically, the ACT is, is not going to be a big generator of carbon offsets and it's not, you know, I can't imagine it's going to be a huge generator of, of negative emissions of any sort unless somebody decides to set up a groovy piece of kit somewhere in the Territory. Did we have another in? Oh, thank you, Natalie. And could you also just say your name um, before you ask your question? Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Kirsten Anker. Um, my question starts with the Gorgon development um, over in over in Western Australia, um, and and it's become almost a mantra um, that carbon capture and storage te technology is is a is a fraud because despite many years of research and development, the latest project, for example, Gorgon has has well and truly failed to meet its its objectives. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts about that particular te technology and more generally, um, what are the, um, what are the um, obstacles do you see in, um, in getting um, carbon capture technologies accepted by, um, by, by the green movement? Great question. 
Thank you so much for that question. That's such an important um, issue you raised. So there is a really important a distinction to make between carbon capture and storage or CCS and what we call carbon dioxide removal, as Caitlin was mentioning up front. Uh, so CCS is really around point source capture of carbon dioxide. And then, as you say, for example, with the Gorgon project, direct injection um, into sometimes depleted oil and gas reservoirs, and in other times uh, for use as enhanced oil recovery to actually increase the amount of fossil fuels that are um, obtained from, from underground. So with carbon dioxide removals, this is uh, by definition re removal from ambient atmosphere. And importantly, it's um, very much dealing with the fact that we've now, we've now passed the point where it's an either or. We now know that we have to remove legacy emissions of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to stabilise our climate and reduce temperature overshoot. So that's one part of it. That's the capture part. Second part is really the, the durable removal. And so it is, I think, very, very important to distinguish the fact that certainly the projects I'm involved with do, do not involve storage in relation to fossil fuel enhancement or fossil fuel recovery. So, for example, the, the um, examples I mentioned were the use of the carbon dioxide, for example, uh, sequestration into porous basalts, uh, mineral carbonation, enhanced weathering. So these are not attached to fossil fuel companies in any way, uh, shape or form. So it's such an important question because the conversation about uh, CCS and carbon dioxide removal has, has not landed at all in Australia. And it's something that these roundtables that I mentioned the, uh, through the Climate Change Authority and the Australian Academy of Science, it was something, this was a question that, that we tackled um, because as I said, CCS is indeed you know, part of the Emissions Reduction Fund, CDR, carbon dioxide removal is not because there's no methodology for it. And so it is extremely important to distinguish those, those two different uh, technologies and indeed the, the fate of the carbon dioxide and what it would be used for. And I guess events like this um, and you going home and talking to folks that you know about this is important for that ongoing public discourse and that building of understanding in Australia about this space. Um, so this is a really great question to sort of what we can do on a personal level. So I'll just give a shout out to Courtney B for submitting this one. On carbon credits, what's the best alternative for paying to offset our own emissions? When I'm booking a flight, should I just tick the carbon offset box um, or should I send that money somewhere else? Spend it on a new iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> it's the biggest waste of money I've ever seen. The offsets that are used for those sort of purposes are, are silly. Yeah, save you money is my advice. And that's not to say there aren't good, good, there are good projects out there. There's good projects under the ERF. They're not all bad, but it's very hard for the average punter to, to separate out the good from the bad. So the safest thing to do is just not, is just not to do it. And that's a shame. That's not a shame. I mean, personally, I start with things like uh, small landfill gas sites. Typically, they need an incentive that most of them are legitimate. I know most of them, I visit a lot of them, they're legitimate in most cases, not all of them, I should say. Uh, in, in planting, tree planting. I mean, if people know how many tree planting, the proportion of ACUs that come from tree planting. I hear it all the time, oh, ACUs is all about tree planting. You know what it is? About 2%, 2 to 2.5% 2 come from tree planting. Most of those tree planting projects are legit. And there's some excellent projects amongst those. Um, but again, it's really, really hard for the average person to separate out the good from the bad. Any other thoughts from the two of you on this one? I think I've learned a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, I if, I to, twice. Yeah. <laughs> if I was to buy a credit, then I would want to be able to do some due diligence myself to understand mm. what's the project, what's, what's the means of sequestration, who's selling it, are the checks and balances there, is there some information there? So this is where the market will evolve. It's going to become become something more than just click the box at your airplane the, um, when you buy your airplane ticket there'll be independent providers and and probably much more information especially if we can get more third-party involvement and more transparency then then we will be able to navigate that 
I just add to that. We work with a lot of uh, big corporates, and the big corporates don't have the ability to do due diligence on projects as well. So if big corporates can't do it, what chance the average individual consumer? And the other key thing there is what, what we often advise corporates to do is rather than grab, grabbing for cheap offsets, do less but make it legitimate. You know, actually make a legitimate reduction in emissions. And it means that you won't be net zero next year. You won't be net zero in in five years, but you'll be making a real reduction in emissions and putting your business on a path to being truly zero in in a reasonable and achievable time frame. Super. We might take one more question from folks in the audience if we have one here. Otherwise, Riley, can we just are we able to get a mic? Thank you so much, Renee. And this will be our last question um, for the ANU climate update. Hi, my name is Wahid. Thank you for this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, my question relates to the last question uh, in terms of there is a kind of greenwashing that's happening with so many of uh, these projects where um, they ask you to pay them like $1 and then you're good to go uh, to take a flight and so on. So what would be the situation with carbon rem removal in that sense? What if companies use that um, wonderful positive project to use it as a greenwashing agenda where they would just like spend 1% of their whole budget in carbon removal and then do all the emission that they already do. So how do we deal with that situation? Thank you. I think this comes back to, um, I think what both Sandra, um, Sarah and Andrew have um, talked about, which is the, the measurement reporting and verification or MRV, which is a significant issue for carbon removals. Um, in terms of international trading platforms, for example, Pure Earth, um, MRV is sort of embedded within some of these uh, trading platforms. So uh, consumers can be somewhat confident that there has indeed been some level of oversight and due diligence um, and that these are indeed responsible, uh, responsible carbon removal offsets. I personally have less faith in, in the formal MRV processes, hence I'm, I'm much more of an advocate for third parties being involved. The, the Emissions Reduction Fund in Australia has MRV processes, it has measurement reporting processes and it has third party audit processes. But what's been happening, remember that silly project I put up on, on the screen, what's been happening there is the auditors go out and say, well, the clean energy regulator says that's fine, tickety-boo, away we go. And it's funny, that strategy you described there, which we often call the coffee cup strategy, right? You have a thin layer of veneer or something good and the rest of it is cheap Nescafe out of the, out of the bucket strategy and they fill it up with crap. Um, and again, I think the only solution to that is that transparency, public participation. The other thing that's happening, which is really fascinating, is the interest that's coming from consumer regulators uh, and others that are able to play in this space. And I'm really keen and really enthused by that prospect because say, take in, in relation to ACUs, any time anyone who's selling an ACU from a substandard project comes out and says, this is a high integrity ACU, and if you've got any suspicion, please come and tell us, because I refer people to section 1041H of the corporation's law. It says that nobody can mislead people in relation to a financial product. It does not matter whether that information was distributed in trade and commerce. Now, I've seen a lot of people over the last three weeks or so doing exactly that. And I dare you to keep doing it because the regulators, good regulators, not the clean energy regulator, good regulators are watching. Also on regulation, I wanna add, just to remind everybody of Andrew's point about regulating the offset space more generally. So buyers can, buyers can be asking about high quality offsets. But the sellers can also be saying, hey, I'm not going to sell you my good offsets until you show me that you've reduced your emissions first. So it's also about who you sell it to. So there are ethical sellers. Um, so restricting the offsets market right down to the space where it is actually being used meaningfully to offset residual emissions that can't otherwise um, be avoided. So it's a sort of a bigger picture than, yeah, just whether the offset's good or not. There needs to be some onus upon the emitter to demonstrate behaviour change first. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Well, this panel um, concludes the uh, 2023 ANU Climate Update. And I do want to say that if you've, um, if what you've heard from your uh, panelists today um, hasn't totally turned you off carbon removal, and you are interested in finding out more about how to do carbon removal in a way that isn't totally bogus, the ANU Below Zero Initiative is looking to stand up carbon removal projects in the land sector that are connected with ANU research and teaching and that demonstrate real co-benefits. Um, we're interested in working with traditional owners, with landholders, with agriculturalists, and with communities in standing up these projects. If that sounds like you or someone you know or a community that you're a part of, we'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch with the ANU Below Zero Initiative via the Institute's website. So I would like to thank all of our speakers from this session and before for sharing their time and their perspectives with us. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, both here in person and online, as you're the folks who uh, make the ANU climate updates possible year after year. I would now like to close the 2023 ANU climate update. A recording of the event will be made available on the Institute's website in the coming days.